Hello, everyone, and welcome to session six of Refuels Week, where we're going to be talking about ensuring social inclusiveness. My name is Dave Keating. I'm a journalist based in Brussels, and I'm coming at you live from the heart of the EU quarter. Now, today we're going to be talking about mobility and the central role it plays in all of our lives. We all have different ways of getting around in order to earn our livelihoods. I live here in central Brussels, and I don't have a car because I don't need one. I can get everywhere I need to go by bike or public transport. But this isn't the case for everyone. I grew up in a suburb in the United States where it isn't even possible to get a quart of milk without getting into a car, let alone being able to get to a job. Mobility is not just a key part of how we live our lives. It can make the difference between poverty and self-sufficiency. In recent years, we've seen a lot of grand ideas come from people who live in cities with plentiful public transport about how we can phase out the automobile. But the cold, hard reality is that for most people in suburban and rural areas, this simply isn't an option right now. The concerns of people in rural areas in particular have often not been taken into account when designing decarbonization policies. We saw this play out in France when an attempt to raise fuel prices resulted in the yellow vest protests across the country, although the extent to which this was really about the hike in fuel tax perhaps we could debate today. The Commission's Smart and Sustainable Mobility Strategy, published in December, took note of this issue. If I can quote the strategy, it said, Mobility is a critical aspect of social inclusion and an important determinant of well-being, including for vulnerable groups of society. Transport fulfills a basic need and has an enabling function insofar that it affects households' income, as well as citizens' ability to integrate into society and the labor market. So with that in mind, today we're going to discuss the risks of erecting barriers to mobility that can affect people's livelihoods. We're also going to talk about how transport can be decarbonized in a way that could be disruptive to technology without being disruptive to people's lives. And we'll also have in mind that if we don't get this right, the backlash could be severe. Now, let me introduce you to the panelists we have with us today to discuss these issues. Here in the studio with me, we have Judith Curtin Darling, a former MEP and now Deputy Secretary General for Industrial, which represents European workers. Hello. We have Alain Mathurin, Communications Director for Fuels Europe, which represents the liquid fuel sector. And joining us remotely, we have Luce Knotter a partner at the consultancy firm Studio Gear Up. Welcome to our panelists, near and far. Uh, let's start with our remote panelists. Luce, I'm gonna start with a question for you. So I've kind of laid out the big picture there in terms of what we're worried about in terms of social inclusiveness, but also some of the potential that we have, of course, with decarbonizing transport, which is all very exciting. So how can we ensure that the transition to the circular economy, the energy transition, how can we ensure that that doesn't leave anyone behind? Well, um, I think, well, there's basically one word and it's often mentioned, uh, technical neutrality. Uh, you basically know where you want to head to and then it's up to the market how to get there. And so I think that technical neutrality is a key concept for policy in this direction. Thanks a lot. Oh, uh, uh, yep, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. No, 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 that's okay. Okay, good. <laughs> Judith, let's turn to you. Uh, so in terms of the energy transition, obviously we're looking at lots of different factors there when it comes to uh, inclusion in the ETS, fuel prices, idea of a carbon tax. How, from the perspective of workers, how will the energy transition impact workers? Well, the, um, the energy transition uh, and the, the increased ambition to 2030, um, which we as a trade union movement are 
um, are supportive of will have an impact on workers right across the whole of the economy. I mean, we have to be really honest about that and um, integrate that into the analysis. What we've seen in terms of mobility um, questions is despite the fact that um, mobility is a, a vital element in social inclusion in the same way that access to affordable energy is a vital element in social inclusion, we haven't seen in the framework up to now, um, in terms of the sustainable mobility framework and decarbonisation measures for um, the transport sector, the integration of a strong social dimension um, into, those, um, into those proposals. And that's essentially what we've been calling for as the trade union movement, is that if we, if we recognise that um, access to affordable mobility is um, a fundamental element of social inclusion in our societies, then we have to have space in policies to ensure that the policy measures which are being rolled out, the legislation which is being rolled out, and the, the various mechanisms integrate uh, questions of equality, access, and uh, recognise the uh, differences within our societies, but also between countries within the European Union, because we are not a homogenous uh, unit as a continent. We have very different realities, um, north, south, east, west, within countries, rural, urban, uh, within, um, between income groups, between different parts of society, uh, people with disabilities, uh, women, um, single mothers, all of that reality, it's very complicated and messy, but if it's not factored into the policy framework, then the risk is that there will be social damage in this process of decarbonisation. And our fundamental message is that that has to be factored into the policy framework. We have some ideas about how that could be done, um, but uh, at the moment, it's just largely absent um, from, uh, from the policy debate. It's actually only been in the last few months with the proposal for the extension of the ETS to road transport that um, there has been a kind of coalescing of voices uh, from uh, NGOs, from industry, from um, the world of politics saying, hang on a second, what does this mean for our most vulnerable um, transport mobility users in Europe? Um, and, uh, and now we need to ensure that that, that concern is really uh, played out in terms of the proposals which we are all waiting for as part of the Fit for 55 package. Yeah, I mean, here in the EU, we often think about the differences between member states, which are vast in a lot of cases. But also, as you mentioned, there are lots of differences between groups in society and also within different geographies within member states. Uh, and, you know, when, when it comes to who's making the decisions, I think we need to always be aware that even national decisions made in national capitals represent a certain segment of society even within member states, mm -hmm. and are sometimes maybe not taking into account the needs of rural people, the people who are not in the metropolis, in the castle, in the, uh, the castle, in the capital. Um, yeah. Alain, let's turn to you. I mean, so Fuels Europe has decided to dedicate today's webinar to this issue of social inclusiveness. Why is it that Fuels Europe is concerned about this issue? Um, thank you, Dave. Indeed, it's. I think it's good to know what, uh, why we are. Uh, so much interested into the social dimension. We have uh, 50 million customers every day that come to our pump stations to fill their cars. Customers, consumers are our first contacts and we need to understand what they're looking for. Um, we already looked into that in 2019. We had a consumer survey that we conducted at the end of the year. Uh, looking into 10 markets in, uh, in Europe, we tried to have a representation of Europe's diversity. And we wanted to understand a bit better how uh, users, and not only users, but con customers in general, consumers, would see the future of their mobility. And um, the, the, the study is available on our website. I didn't want to bother you with many slides, but just a few points. Um, it's quite interesting to, to see that, firstly, when it comes to the split between urban, rural, suburbs, it's not a big share that is living in the cities all over Europe. We can see that we have about 40% living in city centers outside of Brussels, 20, oh, sorry, Brussels, 
one of the cities, of course, 38% living in suburbs, 21 in the countryside. It makes a majority are living outside of the cities. And we, from time to time, have the feeling that the discussion we have here in, in Brussels is very much focused about urban. It's an urban-centering conversation. And we seem to forget uh, the other groups. The other point also which we felt is that we don't hear the voice of the consumer in the debate. We miss it. And that's another important element. And when we ask them how they see the future of their mobility, they are asking for technology options. They're asking for the possibility to choose which technology, depending on the use they make of the vehicle. They often use the car to commute to work, so it's an important tool. 70, 57% sorry, are using the car to go to work, are using the car daily. So we need to take that in consideration. We need to make sure that we can continue providing them with that mobility service. And the interesting point, which then triggers the follow-up question, which is, what is it that will change when we go into another technology, is the choice that the consumer makes when it comes to buying a new vehicle, or to buy a vehicle, new or second-hand. 73% looks at the price. It's a price decision. And the next item is energy consumption, which is also price-driven. We can see other elements, but a focus only on uh, the, the climate dimension in 2019, published 2020, I would like to remind that, it was lower in the ranking. So that's really a financial choice that is made first. So we need to make sure that we can meet that financial choice whilst also proposing climate neutral solutions. This was important. We've been developing our Clean Fuels for All strategy in 2019-2020. Uh, it was important to understand the dimension of the consumer in there. In the meantime, we've also been working together with um, Studio Gear Up, and I think Luz has some slides to present that will be very interesting to share and to see a bit where we are today. Great. Yeah, let's go to those slides uh, from Luz to hear more about what you guys have been looking at uh, for this issue. And just a reminder to you guys at home, you can ask your questions to the panelists by typing them into that bar next to your screen. I'll be seeing them here, and I'll be reading them out to the panelists later. So, Luz, let's uh, go ahead and see that uh, presentation you have. OK, it's my pleasure. <clears throat> I would like to show you some results of our analysis of the European passengers' vehicle market. Uh, I would like to underline that these are our views, and uh, we are an independent consultancy, just to make this sure. Um, to start with, uh, probably this is well known, but I think it's good to realize what in the transport sector is the largest uh, the segment with the largest energy demand. So if we look at all transport segments, you see the energy, energy demand of the international maritime sector, that's the light blue, then the dark blue is the international aviation, then we've got rail, and then you see this very uh, expressively, this road segment, and that is by far the large, largest energy demanding segment. In this segment, approximately half of the energy demand is for light duty, the passenger vehicle segment is in that, and the other half are for medium to heavy duty transport. So, Keep this in mind. And then next, um, I would like to make a reference to one of the presentations, 8th of June, eh, the, in, in this series, series of seminars. Last Wednesday, Kaliopi Panutsu from Imperial College presented new findings on the biomass availability in Europe uh, for actually for waste-based eh, and advanced biofuels. And I thought they were quite stunning, these numbers. So that's what why I would like to go back to these. Um, this is a volume that can be made available uh, without negative impacts on biodiversity yeah, for advanced fuels. And so it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, it's a um, supply for advanced fuels. It's not taking into account all those demands for the other segments. Yeah? That's this on top of that. It's, it's solely for the fuels. She mentioned 88 to 196 million tons of oil equivalents per year of waste-based feedstocks eh, for advanced uh, fuels to be uh, available. Well, we looked at this biomass availability and we just took a very simple, applied a conversion factor of very simple 50%, and this could lead to 45 to up to 100 million ton of oil equivalents of advanced biofuels a year. And um, well, you might then think, okay, so what? Well, let me show you, oh, it's here. Um, let me show you what this means. Eh? So this will mean that it is 
45 to up to 100 million ton could put over tons biofuels could mean potentially yeah, if we are able to make this volume available that we have a share of the total roads and energy demand with advanced biofuels based on the based on waste based there and advanced biofuels and yeah we think that is really amazing an, an amazing number because we have also electrification coming in and other biofuels and other supply chains coming in okay We've seen the road segment is very important. Um, no, I wanted to be sorry. I wanted to go back because there's an important message here still to be made because the production of these renewable fuels will create employment opportunities. Of course, in process technology, in the renewal, renewable electricity capacity and in green hydrogen, but also, and in particular, we will see more jobs in green, we call this green carbon supply chain. So the biofeedstock supply chains. And this will likely be jobs in Europe's rural areas. And I think uh, considering the subject of this seminar, it's actually worthwhile to mention this potential of jobs in, the, in Europe's rural areas. So that was the key message here. Then we continue because we have seen the road segments very important for reducing the climate impacts of the European transport sector. So what is to be expected of the policies now proposed for sustainable mobility, for reducing the climate impacts? The main takeaway is the current European measures will not be enough to lower tank to wheel emissions in transport by 2030 sufficiently. The projected reduction will largely rely on efficiency improvements and uh, in the, actually in the combustion engines and uh, with, in the deployment of renewable fuels. So what do you see in the left figure? Um, among other measures, the European Sustainable and Smart Mobility Strategy is aiming for 30 million battery electric vehicles on the European roads in 2030. You see a projection of still increasing numbers of cars up to 2030. The blue part represents the share of the combustion engines in the total fleet. The green is the plug-in hybrids, and the yellow will be this, then this ingrow of 30 million battery electric vehicles. If we then switch to the right side, the figure at the right side, then we see the following. The effect of these electric vehicles is can consider to be still be very modest because you see this blue, if you can see it, I mean, uh, the blue line in the, in the figure, that will be then the avoided tank to wheel emissions by this ingrow of up to 30 million electric vehicles. The gray area are the fossil emissions. The light green area are the renewable fuels uh, that are uh, targeted with, the, with a target in the renewable energy directive. And a little bit of darker area of green in this green is then the additional volumes that RED2 is, uh, is uh, aiming for. The yellow part, that's then in fact um, the part um, of the voided emissions by using modern combustion engines. Eh? So they make the same kilo, uh, they make the same, uh, they make the same kilometers with more efficient vehicles. And then, ladies and gentlemen, then we have still a striped green line, and that's the minus 55 emission reduction target of the Europe, Europe's Green Deal. So we see basically in the transport sector, it is difficult to reach fast and a quick emission reductions, greenhouse gas emission reductions. Bruce? Are you just trying well, to pull it? Okay. It's just, <laughs> sure. it's just a little bit of the technical thing. I am using my iPad and it was done. Next one. Please. Well, just to be to understand better what we can expect with uh, battery electric vehicles. This is the case of Germany. Uh, you can see, um, I have a bit of a trouble here to see the number, but I think it is about 6.7% um, of new car registrations were a battery electric vehicle in 2020 in Germany. Okay, that's coming. So it's coming. But then, and this is very important, this is the second-hand market 
in Germany. And then you see in 2020, there were about 0.3% battery electric vehicles on the market. And um, this shown in the, the coming slides, I will um, show you why that is, this is an important situation. Uh, because EVs in the used car segment are essential for the accelerated uptake of EVs in the market. Uh, and it is now 2020 and we achieved 0.3 battery electric vehicles in the German market, in this, in this used car market. So what we did, we started in France. This slide shows you the average budgets of various income groups for a new car purchase. Well, you see this blue uh, bar, it, there is a spread in every income group because some do, buy, some do buy a car and others not. So there's a little bit of a spread. So we basically what we did in this diagram, you see basic sales price of typical cars sold in the market. And we took the France market here. And you see here now a new Clio, a Renault Clio, a typical car, is in reach from the second quintile, so the, the second 20% uh, 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 of um, the second quintile of income groups. The typical new battery electric vehicles, such as the Volks, Volkswagen ID3 or the Zoe, are in reach for the highest income groups in France. Okay, this is France. We go to the next one. Germany, we see the, do see that the same Renault Clio is actually only reachable from the third quintile onwards. And also in this case, <laughs> and also in this case, all battery electric vehicles are only in reach of the, the highest income groups. Yeah, then we continue to the next one and that's Hungary, just to give a case. Basically what this shows is that in Hungary, you can see a different picture. All of these typical new cars are out of reach, basically, regardless of the income group. Yeah? Hungary, on average, depends on the second-hand market. Yeah? And this is what I wanted to actually say. The used car segment is extremely important for the accelerate, accelerated uptake of battery electric vehicles. Okay, so far we have looked at disposable budgets for mobility for the different income groups compared to new basic car sales prices. But we have also analyzed this on basis of total cost of ownership and then on a basis of a five years ownership. And the cost of driving a battery electric vehicle are higher. However, this is compensated for with a substantial subsidy, as you can see from this figure. In this example, this subsidy is totaling about 9,000 euros for one car, just to let you understand this number. This is a total cost of ownership analysis for an Eastern European country without incentives. And also in this case, the difference in price between the combustion engine model compared with the battery electric model is rather substantial. Well, this brings me to a reflection. A substantial amount of public funding is spent on stimulating consumers to buy an, ele an electric vehicle. In our analysis, we see amounts of about 6,000 euros over a five years period of time. This would equal a fuel subsidy of approximately one and a half euros a liter eh, for gasoline. Just imagine this budget is used to cover the extra costs to shift to the use of 100% low carbon fuels. Well, I'm from the Netherlands, just so I take an example for the, from the Netherlands. We know that the extra costs for renewable fuels are in the range of 050 cents a liter. Such an amount of subsidy would cover for the extra costs of using 100% renewable fuels for 15 years if you drive 12,000 kilometers a year. Okay, so 15 years you could read, uh, you could actually drive on 100% renewable fuels with the same amount of money. And with this same amount of money, a significant climate reduction can be realized. So it is not that we should spend this money in this way, but it makes clear we have more options for green mobility. And we believe that equal treatment of options from the perspective of climate reductions could mean to have any car driver on board in the, 
in the sustainable mobility transition and not, and not just the ones that can afford an electric vehicle. And um, from the perspective of social inclusiveness, then you might even go faster if you have all drivers on board to reducing the climate impacts of this sector. So this was about it, Dave. Thanks, Luz. That's some really interesting figures there. Uh, let me put some of those figures to you guys. Judith, I mean, we see there that an electric vehicle, a battery electric vehicle is unaffordable to accept the highest quintiles of earners. And in some countries, like in Hungary, not even to them. So how do we get over this hurdle? Because if we look right now, knowing that uh, these new battery electric vehicles are not affordable to working class people and working class people will usually or often buy a secondhand car. And so we're looking at quite a long lead time before these battery electric vehicles are sold for a second time and in a, in a price that's affordable. So how do we get past that, that hurdle when it comes to affordability? Well, I guess the first thing to say is that there are, um, there are different views on this and much will depend on uh, the policy framework. Um, we have to be really clear. If you look at um, studies from transport and environment or I think uh, the European Association of Consumers are about to publish uh, new research in terms of uh, the comparative cost, there are studies which suggest that um, by within a, a matter of years, the, the costs become more accessible. But I think what's really important from the study that Luce has just presented is also um, the fact that for a lot of people in Europe, and particularly the most vulnerable, actually mobility is becoming less accessible because access, people depend on individual mobility, um, but actually the affordability of cars is becoming uh, more complicated. So that means that we can't have an approach where we think that there's one silver bullet uh, to solving sustainable mobility. It's not gonna be um, just enough to promote the uptake of one type of vehicle or one technology or another technology. We actually have to have a comprehensive uh, policy framework, which includes also massive investment in public transport. Um, addresses questions around urban planning um, and, and how cities and, and suburbs in particular, as you were saying, suburbs are organised. We need to look at um, the role and there we also uh, take a view that uh, technology neutrality is, is really important within this framework because we need to take a view of how all different types of technology can play their role because ultimately we know that we are facing a climate emergency and we know that we have to cut emissions and in some ways it's... Um, it's about mobilizing all the different tools uh, that we have in order to reach that objective um, within, within the time frame. Um, but I think, uh, you know, the, from the perspective of, um, of many workers across Europe, um, it's about doing that um, in a way in which they're not paying the price um, for this transition. So as industrial Europe, we have uh, this uh, common mantra that I seem to, uh, the drum that I bang on in every public meeting that we want decarbonisation without deindustrialization in Europe. But we also want decarbonisation without it being the most vulnerable in society that pay the highest proportionate cost. Um, because that would be totally unjust. That would not be a just transition. And therefore, within the policy framework, we need enormous redistribution um, in terms of funds. And there are, there are different ways to organise that. With, uh, with the difficulty, in some ways, within the European Union that we have is that many of the policy levers are at the national level and the emissions um, framework is at the European level. Um, and that's a real challenge for Europe because the danger is that Brussels is seen as applying um, a cost on the most vulnerable consumers and, um, and giving sweeties or uh, incentives to wealthier consumers. Um, and it's up to the actors at national level through taxation, through other measures um, to support vulnerable consum consumers to compensate. 
So we need to be thinking about how, from the European level, we can also ensure that there is redistribution uh, within the system and that um, the most, most vulnerable parts of our societies aren't um, penalised uh, by the collective choice uh, that we, we know we have to take. It's not a question of if, it's a question of how. Uh, but we may have to make sure that that how is socially fair. Um, and um, and we're, we're working with, uh, within the trade union movement with our colleagues in the European Transport Workers Federation, for example, uh, to try and see the role of different modes of transport, modal shifts, uh, technology development in vehicles, um, different uh, industrial policy instruments and obviously uh, there's for us very important is is also the uh, the kind of transition for the workforce who will be impacted by all of these social changes um, within transport uh, transport service provision and in vehicle manufacturing so um, it's yeah there's no silver bullet in this story uh, from our perspective uh, but we, we need a really comprehensive European framework to ensure that uh, we get to the right place. I want to come back to this issue you mentioned of public transport, particularly in suburban areas. But first, Alain, I want to get your reaction to some of the figures we heard there, particularly on affordability. Thank you, Dave. Um, interesting, interesting slides, interesting figures. Um, it, it drives two immediate conclusions. The first one is, we can see that subsidies will help to take the price of the battery electric vehicle down. And as we always, we always said, new technologies need to be supported. So there's no point in, in challenging the idea of the subsidy. Where we are a bit more worried is that we are only talking about the new vehicles when it comes to affordability. Yes, they will be at the same price. But what really strikes me is when we look at the, at the um, average budget for transport, those three slides that were shown, and we can see that there are huge discrepancies between regions in, in, in Europe. Even interestingly to see that France has a higher lowest quartile compared to Germany, which was a surprise to me when I was looking at the slides. But when you look at Hungary, it's interesting to see that none of the new vehicles are part of the purchase power of our consumers. And this is really what we have to look at. The debate should not be, are EVs at the same price as new ICs? That's fine. The debate is, who will not be able to afford a second-hand vehicle because either we will have bans on the ICE, either we will have a higher price on the fuel, on the conventional fuel, meaning that they will be most impacted. And we need to really consider how can we make sure that everybody has that access. So the point uh, we also see is that one of the reactions that we will trigger, and you mentioned it, Luz, is a longer ownership of the vehicles. And that's something that we can also see on the ASEA slides. Uh, we can see that the regions where we have that lower average budget, vehicles are kept much longer, uh, between 16 and 18 years in some of the Central Eastern uh, uh, countries. This is a signal. This means that this will slow down this transition to a more uh, climate neutral mobility. And we believe this is where low carbon fuels have a role to play. Interesting to see that if you were able to provide some of the support scheme that you have for EVs to the low carbon fuels, you could make those fuels much quickly, much quicker, sorry, uh, affordable. Because the average additional cost that represents the subsidy level, it's interesting, it's a number that was calculated by Luz, so I, 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 uh, don't, I didn't check it, but 150 a liter is a huge amount. I remember that Tobias Block from eFuels Alliance mentioned that we could estimate the average cost for an e -fuel, a liter of e-fuel at 160. I assume this was without tax. So we are getting closer to something which becomes affordable to all drivers, and we don't need to penalize those that cannot afford new vehicles. Yeah, of course, the key point is that subsidies for fuel can go, can go directly into a second-hand vehicle, and right now, subsidies for electric vehicles are targeted at the new vehicles. Is a possible solution to offer subsidies for second-hand electric vehicles, or in any event, are we so many years away from those starting to come on the second-hand market that that wouldn't do any good? I, I, th I mean, I, I think that we're at that stage where the second-hand market for e-vehicles is, is starting, but it's a question of how many vehicles are part of 
the fleet, isn't it? So that has to pick up and it has to be part of, um, again, this comprehensive um, policy framework. Um, I would say that I think we're, the scale of the challenge means that we're talking about um, and um, kind of uh, solutions rather than either or um, solutions because we need to, to see um, those emissions come down. So we need all of the options um, to, to be able uh, to, to achieve that. Clearly at the moment, um, in terms of many parts of the passenger car uh, sector, e-mobility is seen as the first option. And, um, and we have to see how we ensure the, the complementarity of, um, of liquid fuels is, is kind of uh, ensured so that we don't end up with that increased inequality um, uh, down the line. I think it's, it's really worth emphasizing uh, the point about uh, Central and Eastern Europe and Western Europe. I, I found quite an interesting figure um, when I was preparing um, this, uh, this panel and also when we've been talking about this um, in relation to uh, the whole Fit for 55 package that within Belgium, for example, 28.8% of cars are over 10 years old of the car fleet, compared to Lithuania, where 83% of the car fleet is over 10 years old. And we have to recognize that there's, there is this, um, this internal market factor within Europe where in many Western European countries, consumers buy um, cars new, and then those cars become no the new cars, if you like, in Central and Eastern Europe, um, but as second -hand car, in a second-hand car market. So we also have to ensure that we don't end up with greater fragmentation um, across Europe, because that would be, in terms of political cohesion, in terms of uh, um, social cohesion within societies, that's also quite a, a dangerous route for the European Union. Um, and um, yeah, I'm sure, we maybe come on to some of those dangers, but uh, but I think it's just worth flagging up just how considerable the difference is. Um, yeah, you could see a kind of nightmare scenario where all the subsidies are going to new electric vehicles that we're all driving here in Western European cities, and then our former ICE cars are going east all to Central and Eastern Europe or to rural areas in our own countries, and then the fuel prices go way up. That's not a great situation, and I think for sure would spark backlash. Um, Alain, did you I, want to come yeah, I wanted, I wanted to add a point on the second-hand uh, market for EVs. Um, we have to remember that the second-hand market for EVs has to be able to provide vehicles that are within the affordability level of people living in Central Eastern Europe, like we saw for Hungary. So can we buy a second-hand EV for three or 4,000 euros? I have no idea. Luz, I don't know, maybe you have something about that. But this is a question. If you have to change a battery, what's the cost of the battery? So these are questions that I cannot answer, but I think they deserve to be looked at before we say that there will be an easy second-hand, accessible second-hand for, uh, for battery electric vehicles. Well, we have a related question to this issue that's come in from the audience, so let me put this to Luce right now. Uh, the questioner asks, Luce, how did you calculate depreciation and how do you explain the difference between ICE and EVs when it comes to depreciation? Good question. Uh, um, without being able to go now in all the details, but we took uh, the depreciation numbers we could find um, in the model for both the battery electric vehicle and the ICE. The, the difference you have to imagine we have taken uh, most of the we have made a selection of the top within the top 10 best selling vehicles and yes we indeed in those selection per country we looked at the depreciation costs in our model let me put another question to you that's come in uh, how do you take into account indirect subsidies to ICE cars, such as company car taxation that exists yeah. in many member states, including the one we're in here mm -hmm. in Belgium? Oh, yeah. Well, I would say, like you to all invite you to come on board here in the studio and to 
Exactly, because yes, there are so many indirect uh, incentives that we all, so it's at a certain point you have to sort of in the scope of the TCO, you have to put a boundary, but we are aware that there are even other indirect uh, subsidies and perhaps in an other version of the TCO, we could start including them. That's interesting. Um, so as promised, I did want to come back to this issue of public transport and suburban areas because Alain, I wanted to push back a bit on what you said before because yeah, if you combine suburban and rural areas, they are together larger than cities, but suburban straddles the two, right? So it's a question of where do you put it? And the clue is in the name, it's suburban. So uh, could someone argue that actually the, the focus for suburban areas, yes, we can acknowledge that for rural areas, public transport's never gonna be a solution. But for suburban areas, there we see a huge geographic difference, right? Here in Belgium, every little town has a train station that is Absolutely not the case where I come from. I'm from about an hour outside New York City. We have no trains at all. They were completely dismantled in the US uh, decades ago. Uh, so for suburban areas, shouldn't countries like Belgium serve as a model where you have suburban areas connected by rail and you make it a possibility here in Belgium for somebody to live out in the suburbs and commute to Bel into Brussels or Antwerp or wherever else easily every day? Um, it's indeed a fair question, and when it, when, as you say, suburbs means close to the urban area. Uh, it will depend from one country to the other. Brussels and Belgium is probably better equipped in terms of, of accessibility through trains. There are other countries where the accessib accessibility is not at the same level. Um, this being said, we do believe that public transport has to deliver a service to the consumer, and this will start over time and increase. We believe there will be a strong push for that, and that's good. We need to find all the ways by which we can improve the efficiency of transport. That's, that's, a, that's a given. But the, the, the speed at which this will be able, when you look at, um, if I remember, I saw an article this week for this Belgian uh, network that they are building, it won't be finished by 2030. Yeah. So you're taking me the example of Brussels and Belgium regarding many train stations, but the network is not yet effective as it should be. And many people will continue using their cars. And I think there's also the aspect of working hours, the offer and all of that. It's, it's a broader question. You're not saying you live in a suburb, you have a train station. True, yeah, because if that train station only has one train an hour, exactly. it's not very useful to you, which is the case for a lot of these smaller train stations in Belgium. Um, Judith, how do you come in on this issue? Because, yeah, exactly, these, especially when we're taking into account that different countries are coming from very different starting points, and building public transport is a long process, especially when you're talking about trains. You're talking about if you have a suburban ring area, commuting area that doesn't really have anything, it'll take you at least 10 years to actually build a real system. And certainly I know in the US, the, the country I'm from, that is, that's the problem they're encountering, that they acknowledge that it was a mistake to dismantle our suburban rail networks, but what do you do now? Because it would take so much money and so much time and demolishing so many houses uh, and buildings to build that. So where should we spend money? Where should we spend our tax money on? Should we spend it on, no, let's do this even though we know it's gonna take a long time, let's build that public transport infrastructure. Should we spend it on, no, let's clean up the fuels used in our existing car technologies, or should we spend it on electric vehicles? I think I know your answer is going to be all of it, but where should it be prioritized? <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, investment in public transport is a long-term um, sustainable investment for our society. So it's absolutely vital uh, that we promote, and I should say we, you know, we're uh, in some ways have um, our eggs in all these baskets because we, our members are building and making cars across Europe, but we're also making buses. We're also making uh, trains um, in Europe. So uh, it's, it's really vital uh, that we have that long-term investment in, in our urban, in our public transport system across the board. That, that I think is, is, uh, is a priority. I guess, in terms of how you then um, bridge the gap, I think that's where a lot of our concern is, is that we have this, we're gonna have this framework of increased ambition towards 2030. 
We know that, um, and it, to be fair, it's this, it, just to make a parallel, it's the same in construction and in heating fuels as well, where we know the long-term agenda is a renovation wave, improving energy efficiency of buildings and, and adapting, and there are many new technologies and, and um, similar kind of discussion about the potential, but technologies which will come down the line. Um, and in both sectors, it's about how we bridge the gap for the most vulnerable consumers. And I think there um, we need large scale recycling of money, redistribution in effect, and support to the most vulnerable, vulnerable parts of our society. Because if you take a very concrete example, um, Alain's point is an important one. If you take a, a, the example of a, a single mother who um, has atypical working hours in a factory and has a precarious contract um, and isn't, um, isn't very well paid, then actually uh, their vehicle is an absolutely essential part of, of ensuring that they are able, to, uh, that, that person is able to, uh, um, to live a, as decent a life as possible. So, I mean, it won't surprise you that from a trade union perspective, we're not just asking for redistribution for the increased cost, but we also have to look at um, inequalities in our societies more broadly um, and lifting, um, you know, those bottom segments in Lucy's slides, those, the bottom quintiles of our society. Um, part of this is beyond the debate about mobility. It's a debate about um, pay and, um, and about taxation, progressive taxation systems. But we have to recognise that these these issues are very tightly bound together when we're talking about a transition at the pace at which um, we're, we're intending to move um, to deal with climate change. And if we don't have that strong social dimension to our climate um, policies, then we will be penalizing those who are the most vulnerable in our societies. And that will be corrosive um, to our societies, corrosive socially, economically, but also um, uh, it's very clearly has big political ramifications uh, for the future. And, um, you know, the, the Yellow Vest movement in France and, and elsewhere was, I think, a little bit of a warning signal that should be taken far, far more seriously uh, by policymakers. Yeah, for sure. This conversation isn't taking place in a vacuum. And when we look at those uh, statistics from Lucy's slide, the, the obvious question is, why is there such a difference between the uh, quintetas? But that's a whole other yeah. topic that's maybe above our pay grade even. Uh, certainly complicated issues. Let me put another question from the audience to Luz. Uh, this questioner asks, beyond purchase price, what other aspects determine the purchase choice of a car? For example, range, availability of recharging outlets, et cetera. And here's where I also think there's probably a big geographic difference because obviously if you're thinking about buying an electric car, you might have uh, at this point or soon plentiful recharging outlets in a city, probably not in a suburb, definitely not in a rural area. So how do those factors influence someone's choice, Luz? Yes, uh, Alan was mentioning that costs are very important here in the research of uh, Fuels Europe. Um, we believe uh, um, functionality will also come um, as a very important subject because in in a way the range is is of course an important subject and that's why electric mobility the vehicles on the market for urban transportation yes they are fine but if you will have if you depend on longer distances you you will need then uh, the infrastructure in place otherwise you won't come home anymore so the, the range is that is an issue it, it it is addressed and i'm confident that the market will also find solutions for the range, but it is an issue, as also, and, but also other functionality. Yeah? There are people that would like to uh, have, for instance, uh, well, perhaps they have five uh, family uh, uh, members, and then we need, we need enough offer to the market. So I think, and then the price, you know, uh, Alan, you asked me if there's a, a battery electric vehicle, well, the, the current battery electric vehicles are basically out of reach for the most budgets. Yeah? And um, 
you would like to actually stimulate those battery electric vehicles that are also very much uh, uh, sold on the, on the second-hand market, eh? so that are the smaller models that are cheaper. And if we actually, it would be a very good idea, I think, for a public policy to stimulate, stimulate especially the smaller, cheaper electric vehicles in the yeah, new, uh, new sold, so that we have actually an offer then in the second-hand market that is actually the most chosen, eh? the most, um, well, but where we see the most transi uh, transactions in the second-hand market. So in fact, you would like to actually get more, less expensive models that then also will be uh, the, the models of choice in the second-hand markets, uh, if that makes sense. That's interesting. Um, let, I guess, go ahead. Uh, sorry, no, just to, just jumping onto to that point. I mean, we're in the Brussels bubble. We're hearing um, this week from uh, from Timmermans. He announced in the Economic and Social Committee on Monday uh, that there will be, um, alongside the extension of the ETS, the creation of some kind of social climate um, fund, recycling revenue from um, an ETS scheme for road transport back to vulnerable users. Obviously, we will be watching the detail of this very carefully, but it'd be interesting uh, to, to see how, um, how such a system could uh, ensure really that you, you are hitting the right parts of society in a way that it really gets to the people who need the, the support. And, uh, obviously, um, ensuring that second-hand uh, market is part of that, um, and and the smaller vehicles. Um, but um, but there are there are other policy. There are other potentially uh, big questions about how you you ensure that those recycled revenues really hit the pockets of um, the poorest uh, uh, mobility users, um, and um, and I just. Uh, it, it is kind of it, it would be a question for me to to lose maybe um, to to think how, what other policy um, uh, proposals could be part of that mix to ensure that um, you actually ended up with recycled revenues uh, getting to the the right place because I think this is now going to be one of the central political questions in the European debate um, and and I think. Um, over the next few weeks, um, there will be a lot of policymakers looking for ideas about how to bridge that gap in the next few years for the to 2030. Yeah, Luce, let's hear your thoughts and options for that. Just to get the audience up to speed, so what we're talking about here Sorry. is the, the policy elephant in the room, if you will. Uh, uh, so far, buildings and transport have been outside of the, the barriers of the uh, emissions uh, trading scheme for the EU, uh, but there's been pressure to bring them in, and we are expecting the Commission, as part of this Fit for 55 exercise uh, in mid-July, to announce that they are expanding the ETS to buildings and transport, but by putting them in a kind of separate ETS. So transport, it looks like, if this uh, is indeed proposed and approved by the co-legislators, will, for the first time, have a, a price on the carbon. Uh, which is going to make a big difference. There's different estimates about what that's going to mean in terms of increases on fuel costs, uh, and there's lots of different opinions about this. Uh, but one of the debates going on here is what do you do with that money? That money that's going to be generated from the transport ETS, where should it go? Uh, so, Lucia, what are your thoughts about options about how we make sure that the money gets back to the consumer? Well, look at what the ETS is going to be doing, likely. It, will, it wants to raise the price for the internal combustion engine and the fossil fuels. So it's going to be vital, in my view, really vital, that this support should be also to provide green option for the combustion driver. So I think it would be vital if you do an ETS transport that you have then money to invest in low-carbon liquid fuels so that actually people that have to drive a combustion engine for whatever reason uh, have green options. Otherwise, uh, the ETS plus all the carbon taxes and plus the CO2 standards, it's all piling up and makes a transportation for the combustion engine driver really, really a lot, of, a lot more expensive. Alain, what is, your, what is Fuels Europe's stance on this issue of expanding the ETS to transport? 
Um, <clears throat> Fuels Europe supports the idea of an ETS for transport, meaning not transport in it's the ETS. Let's be very clear yeah. about that, a dedicated EDS. Um, we also believe that some of the funds should be reused to support the technology uptake of those low-carbon technologies, which include low-carbon fuels. They, they have a role to play there, and this can be a, a very good way to incentivize those. I think, just on a general point, any low-carbon technology should benefit from the same support whatever it is. And I think altogether, all these technologies will complement each other to achieve, and we can see the fragmentation of the European market, will make it such that besides the richer countries, lower income countries will benefit from another type of technology that can help. And we'll see whether this continues or whether one technology takes it over, the future will tell us. Um, we have to remember one thing when you mentioned that the ETS and the fund, if I'm right, ETS is taken at the European level, but the funds are channeled to the countries. So we'll have to see, and this is a risk we will take, if those funds are channeled to countries but are not used in the same way, we'll have another fragmentation of the single market, because you will see that some countries will indeed support the uptake of those technologies, other will use it for other purposes. So I think, I don't know how they will manage that in the Fit for 55, what will be the conditions around it, we'll have to see, but let's not forget that. That'll be a really interesting thing to watch for Fit to 55, to 455, <laughs> what kind of leeway the member states have in spending it. Yeah, I, I think it's, I mean, we have different views on the ETS. We, we and, um, and a number of organizations, other organizations in the, uh, as I said earlier, in the kind of Brussels um, environment have strongly opposed the the extension of carbon pricing uh, to road transport, partly because it's based on the principle that economic actors make rational choices and that they can influence those choices. And as we've talked about this morning, mobility isn't always a question of choice. It's also a question of constraints. So if you are then applying carbon pricing, you're effectively applying a regressive taxation um, in, in the model. And for us, that's, that's really problematic on a, a kind of fundamental level. But we also are not blind to the political debate. It's very clear that there is a strong pressure for the creation of a separate ETS. So um, in a sense, uh, with now within the trade union movement, we are um, having putting ourselves in the position of saying this isn't what we want. We think it's the wrong thing to do. We will say that in black and white straight out. If this is the way that policymakers decide to go, then you have to really um, make extremely watertight um, social uh, inclusion provisions alongside. Um, and it's, it's been interesting to, to see how the debate has kind of shifted at European level with the concerns of us as workers, uh, the environmentalists, uh, the left in the European Parliament, uh, the consumer groups, that actually those concerns have kind of been taken up to an extent in some of the um, Commission discussion. But I still have never have not seen an impact assessment of what the of how you would ensure that actually policy didn't have an enormously regressive impact on the most vulnerable groups of workers and and people um, in society. So I think this whole debate is going to be uh, probably one of the you know the fit fifty fifty five package is what seventeen pieces of legislation. There's going to be a lot of complicated technical detail when it comes out but this is going to be I would imagine one of the biggest political debates in the whole the whole package because it will be understood on the ground across in every member state of the European Union if it's perceived as Europe imposing a tax on the most vulnerable um, users so they have to get it right um, and I, I don't like the language, have it, being as a former MEP, I'm very cautious about using the language of ivory towers or people disconnected, making policy disconnected from where they come from, because I don't think that's always the case. But boy, uh, the people who are making the political decisions on this package will have to really understand what the political implications of it are on the ground in different parts of Europe because it potentially could be really explosive. And, um, and for us, that's a massive concern because it's also the danger is that this is a seedbed for populists and for um, those who are pushing um, very uh, 
you know, classic um, Eurosceptic and, um, and uh, right-wing ideologies across Europe. And we in the trade union movement don't want to give, uh, not <laughs> to uh, use a, a pun, but we don't want to put any petrol on that fire um, at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> an apt an analogy, or I'm not sure. Um, I, I wrote an article about this a couple of months ago about putting a carbon price in transport, and I was really struck by the ferocity of the opposition to this among uh, NGOs, environmentalists, climate groups, and the left. Uh, it is incredibly unpopular with large segments of the policy crowd here in Brussels. Um, and uh, maybe I could sum up their argument against it and put it to you alone. So, one of the big concerns is that this is going to be used as an excuse to not increase ambitious uh, fuel standards uh, going forward, and that this is a way for the automotive industry to avoid other caps that might have come into play, because in the coming years they'll be able to say, but you, you put this transport ETS uh, in place, so you can't uh, then add extra burdens. Is there a risk of that, that, that you are that this is going to mollify other areas of, of uh, carbon caps that could have come into effect? Well, um, firstly, I think when we say that we, we support a, a dedicated ETS, because we really feel that the trajectory that the Commission is taking is within the idea of setting up that specific ETS scheme. So between the two options be transport in the ETS and all the risk for other industry sectors, and a dedicated ETS, will prefer the, the dedicated one. Um, you know, the starting point of the discussion, if you step back, it's why don't we recognize the contribution of liquid fuels to the performance of vehicles? This is where it all starts. If there was a recognition of that, you would have a different, a different approach to, to the entire system. But the fuels currently are, are not treated as such, and that would accelerate the uptake. The Commission doesn't want, they want to keep a separate uh, in their CO2 standards, they want to apply it specifically to the vehicle manufacturers. Uh, we believe that there would be a strong benefit in having that association because it would be able to accelerate and there are various ways to do so. But when you, when you think what today the system is, you have an electric vehicle, you will benefit about uh, over its lifetime, 27,000 euros, we took an example in Berlin, 27,000 euros of uh, incentives of all types, EU, EU level, municipal level, national level, between parking spaces, no toll for bridges or whatever, uh, the incentive when you purchase a vehicle, no taxes, etc. If you take the same vehicle that will also have a zero gram rating because it uses 100% renewable fuels, there's no single euro of benefit. How is it possible that those two similar uh, options that deliver zero are not treated in the same way? If we take it from there, we would probably be able to develop a much more smoother way to, to, to uh, address the challenge. But this is where we are trying to, of course, push for the low carbon fuels because we believe they will address partially the challenge of the European driver by offering multiple technologies where it is important in terms of affordability. Well, let me take a, a question from the audience. It's really more of a statement, but I think it really speaks to, Judith, what you were just talking about. So the, the person from the audience says, taking from the poor in the form of a fuel and car tax and giving to the rich subsidies for electric vehicles, is this Robin Hood reversed? And it really does, I mean, that is the nightmare scenario here where you have a dedicated ETS that is causing fuel prices to go up and a certain member states decides to use all of those proceeds for electric vehicles which are only driven by elites in cities. Is that, is that a realistic risk and how do we avoid that happening? It, it, that's, it, it is a realistic risk if you don't factor into the, um, into the policy a strong social dimension. Um, we have, uh, as I said, uh, we have opposed um, the use of carbon pricing um, for, for road transport, ETS, the extension of ETS um, for road transport, because we see uh, the existing, the kind of regulations and standards are actually a better, more smooth way uh, to get to where we want to get to in terms of um, decarbonisation. The, the danger is that, um, I mean, we, we have to put this also into a broader context at European level. 
Um, we're, many of our concerns have also been that the extension of the ETS is driven not just by um, the hope from certain quarters of industry that um, carbon pricing will mean reduced uh, standards, um, but it's also driven by the current context that we find ourselves in post-COVID with the recovery plan and the European Commission looking for ways that we can repay um, the, the recovery plan down the line. And we see some of the same debate when we talk about the CBAM, the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, and how the revenue of the CBAM will be used. The same with the normal ETS uh, revenue as well. That increasingly these are seen as sources to repay the coronavirus um, debt. And that for us is really, is really dangerous because in fact the revenue of all of these mechanisms should be being recycled back on the one hand to supporting the most vulnerable, but on the other hand into innovation and research and development to ensure that we're able to, to win the technological change and to be on the in the lead in terms of industrial policy. So um, yeah, there is an enormous risk that this is Robin Hood reversed um, and, um, and we have tried a little bit like Cassandra, where sometimes I feel like a Cassandra um, saying um, what the, the risk is. Um, but, um, but now we have to see, and we will be waiting with bated breath to see what uh, um, uh, the Vice President Timmons and uh, the Commission reveal in terms of the social dimension of this new ETS system. If it's not up to measure, then I can imagine there will be, a, you said there was vociferous opposition to the idea. I don't think those organisations are, are going to be sitting back and quietly no. accepting a, a kind of fig leaf policy um, that is just too important uh, to, to get this wrong at this stage. Um, it's interesting how many of the climate proposals coming out of the Berlaymont at the moment involve own resources generation. I think that's... It's a whole other topic. Cynics might say. Yes. Um, Alon, you mentioned before that you, you're not opposed to electric vehicle subsidies. They need subsidies to get this new technology off the ground. So how do you balance this, making sure that the electric vehicles get subsidies, but also make sure that the subsidies aren't coming at the expense of people who are not in a financial position to enjoy the electric vehicles? Well, and... I think this is, um, I quite like the nicely way to talk about the Robin Hood uh, reversed. Um, what, we, what we want to, to, to mention is we have one objective. Let's never forget that. We need to decarbonize the transport sector, and there's no discussion about that. And the quicker the better, depending, of course, which are the conditions, which are the impacts, and this is why the social dimension is so important, and we wanted to dive into this. Um, we strongly believe electrification will be one of the major technologies in the road transport, in the passenger car segment for sure. So there's no point in, in putting that against anything there. The subsidies are there to take it up. How long will it be able to finance at that level the number of cars that will be put on the road? Because we have 250 million cars in Europe. We cannot pay for each of them. But we have to remember when it comes to new vehicles, there is a share, and I look at the slides that presented by Luz, of population that will not have that access to new vehicles. What are we going to propose them? And if we only are into a uh, support scheme for battery electric vehicles and we ignore the role that low carbon liquid fuels can deliver, we will end up by having a significant gap between social parts in the society. The problem is, once that decision is made, it will be a regret decision. Having the low carbon fuels today that are able to compensate, to complement the full technology offer will enable to have a no regret option. If ultimately the market conditions are such that the electric vehicle will become dominant even at 95% or 100% if this is what happens at the end of the day, those fuels will go into the other hard to abate sectors and we have enough of them. We have heavy duty, long haul, we have aviation, we have maritime. But let's not forget that the immediate uh, consequences of disregarding the access to mobility to all of European citizens will have short-term effects. The fleet uh, uh, shift is a long-term 
challenge. So we need to bridge that gap. This is where low-carbon fuels have a role to play. And if we were into a scheme that would incentivize the uptake of those fuels, I don't say that we answer to the entire challenge, but we do offer a proposal that might help those that cannot afford more than 5K for a car to get access to clean transportation. Because ultimately, you don't want to have a share of the population which is driving vehicles, and they are just saying, hey, you're the polluter. We don't want that. We want everybody to be able to contribute, and I think that's an important point. So low carbon fuels can do that job. So we have another question from the audience for Luz. Uh, this question comes from Sergio Casadiego. Uh, regarding battery electric vehicles, have you analyzed the Norwegian model in terms of new car sales and secondhand sales? I always would like to ask a question back in the return. Um, why? Eh? Um, no, we didn't particularly look at Norway. Uh, we took a uh, selection of European member states and Norway was not included. So perhaps you could ask this person to ask why you, he, he or she, I don't, didn't hear the name, uh, think it's, it, it is relevant. Yeah, uh, maybe you could, Sergio could come back to us on that. Uh, I'm not yeah. familiar with a particular model in Norway for secondhand sales, are you? I, I think, uh, I, I imagine, I don't know um, where the question comes from, but I imagine that it's more related to the Norwegian policy in terms of um, ice phase out and um, massive expansion of the electric vehicles fleet. Um, when I was uh, a uh, member of the European Parliament, I was um, uh, represented the northeast of England, which has uh, the Nissan plant in Sunderland as within the constituency, producing uh, leaf vehicles. And when I remember when Norway announced their new EV policy, um, suddenly all of the you know the timeline time lag to get an electric vehicle shot up in terms of. Um, uh, months that you had to wait after an order because the demand from Norway was so considerable. So I imagine that the question is that since that policy has been in place for a while, there is a higher proportion of electric vehicles in the domestic market. Presumably those vehicles are now coming into the second hand uh, market as well. I guess that's where it comes from, but um, I, I, I don't have a detailed view of what that market looks like in Norway um, at the moment. Our Norwegian affiliates obviously do. Luz? Yeah. Well, that's the thing. What I would like to, to, of course, what I would like to know from the Norway situation, what is their household average budget? Yeah? It could be that in Norway, the household budgets are, uh, are different. So that would be then uh, something that would be interesting to look at. Uh, we also know that there is indeed quite some uh, subsidy also on this uh, cars in Norway. So yes, um, it's interesting, but Norway is a rich country, and uh, with uh, more money and public spending, you can do more, perhaps. I think that is always the caveat with Norway, is that we very few of us are in a Norwegian situation, right? So they can do things the rest of us can't. Um, okay, for a final question to each of you, I want to ask, we've talked a lot about the challenges here, and they are myriad. Um, Maybe for the final point, I could ask about possible solutions. Uh, so if you were Ursula von der Leyen for a day, what would be, you think, the, the, the most effective proposal you could put forward to solve this issue of making sure that we can subsidize new low carbon technologies without disadvantaging lower income people? Alain? Well. Would be glad if I could do that in reality, <laughs> but nevertheless, I think this will be. Uh, I'll probably already touch on it in my previous interventions. I think when it comes to uh, what could be the way, we have to enable all renewable technologies to compete at the same level. So, if we have incentives for one type of technology, we should enable the others to benefit of the same. It will enable, firstly, people to have a choice. It will people to buy the vehicles that are best suited for their personal use and personal budget. But as long as we ensure that they deliver the same contribution to climate, it doesn't matter which technology. So for me, it's really all renewables to compete at the same level. Luz, what do you think? What would be the most effective policy you could think of? Well, well in the sustainable mobility transition, I think the subject of cost effectiveness needs more um, needs more attention, basically. And um, so that's one, but 
if you then specifically for this question, I would say um, if you would introduce an ETS transport and, and all kind of road pricing schemes and all these things, you will need indeed to um, also incentivize the use of green fuel options yeah? because otherwise someone else does, if you can't afford electric an electric vehicle, you don't have options anymore and the costs are only rising. So it's essential that the green fuel options are included then in the in this in the schemes. And Judith, if you were Ursula von der Leyen for a day, what would you do? Well, I think it's cruel because right at the beginning I said there's no silver bullet. So I'm I'm gonna start with that caveat, but I think it's it's really clear that um, we need uh, to be renewing the European fleet um, and we need an industrial kind of policy framework um, which ensures that we can we can renew the fleet as quickly as possible and um, but we have to recognize within that that one size fits nobody in this case um, if we don't if you don't have the understanding of the the mobility uh, situation in different member states, then that fleet renewal will benefit at Western Europe um, at the expense probably more of Eastern Europe. So we need to have a, a fleet renewal agenda which is uh, which really kind of recognises the differences between different member states and parts of the population. As I said, no silver bullet. I'm really sorry. I'm not a journalist's <laughs> dream. Well, also, Ursula von der Leyen is not in some kind of omnipotent position either, so True. it's maybe not True the enough. most powerful person you'd want to be. Uh, so I want to thank our panelists, uh, near and far, for some great interventions, and thank you at home for following along with us and asking some great questions, some of them literary-inspired with Robin Hood references. Uh, so let me tell you about our final ser uh, webinar in the series, which will be Monday at 10 o'clock, and we're going to be talking about urban air quality. Uh, so until then, I wish you all a great weekend, and we'll see you on Monday at 10 o'clock for the final webinar in this series. Take care.